Am I sounding okay? Do I sound all right? Good? Sounds cool. Grand. Thank you. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to join you all this morning. My name is Jasmine Sudarkasa. I am the executive director of the Kerr Foundation, which I will share more about in a bit, but I am very lucky to be joined in conversation today by the one and only Edgar Villanueva. And so I thought to start this off in a participatory way, rather than read your bio, Edgar, I'd love for you to introduce yourself in a way that feels meaningful to you. Um, I'll start. I am a Black queer woman. I really like astrology. I happen to run a foundation that invests in queer women's media and the future leadership of LGBTQ journalists. And I came to this group due to an invitation from a really, really good group of people last March because I was doing a research project on participatory grant making in my former role at the Hewlett Foundation. And so I can attribute a lot of my uh, success in this sector actually to this group of folks. I've been welcomed in time and time again to learn, to share, and now to present. And so I'm really happy to be here this morning. Edgar, how would you introduce yourself? Hi, Jasmine. Hi, everyone. Uh, really exciting to see so many uh, names in the chat of friends and people from all over. Um, I'm Edgar Villanueva. I am uh, an enrolled member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, Native American. I reside in New York City. This is the unceded territory of the, the Lenape tribe. And um, I am, you know, I'm an activist, a writer, disruptor, trying to cause good trouble everywhere I go to uh, get resources to Black and Brown and Indigenous folks um, in the work. So thanks for having me today. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, and I mean, I have lots to talk about, but I thought I'd give the group a little overview of how we're going to spend our time. I'll spend about 30 minutes asking some questions that I have for Edgar. Then we'll spend about 20 to 25 minutes taking questions in the chat. So feel free to drop them as we talk. Things captivate you. You want to follow up. I like to keep this interactive. We've all been in Zoom hell for a year and some change. So let's keep it interactive. Enter your questions. We'll take some questions and then we'll close with a few uh, announcements. Does that sound good, Hannah? Awesome. Okay. So the first question I have is really around the key sets of values that participatory grant makers use to inform their work. In my research project, I really found that although this practice is very much, I would say, beginning to formalize its theories of change, um, there is a very clear set of values that resonates across the spectrum. And one of them is a very clear responsibility to meet and reflect social movements that motivate them. I think about the Disability Rights Fund and its origins in the disability rights movement. You know, there is absolutely this connection to movement that cannot be denied. And in your book, you suggest that many people of color who are in philanthropy are motivated by the same sort of commitment to movements. To quote you, we earnestly hope and sometimes believe that we can connect foundations assets with our drive to improve outcomes for the planet and its people, especially people in our own communities. So as much as we can, you know, go off on traditional philanthropy, you and I are both folks who work in philanthropy, queer people of color, and more and more funding from these traditional institutions is moving to our communities. So what role do you and I and other folks of color and in institutions like this, what role do we need to play in meeting movements in 2021? Yeah, um, really great question. I love kicking off in this way. Um, so yeah, I, I've been known to criticize institutional philanthropy, um, you know, lovingly, because I still work in philanthropy um, in an effort to just push us to a better place. Um, but even with the critique, I acknowledge that philanthropy, both institutional and sort of community philanthropy has played significant roles historically in supporting social movements, right? Um, there's lots of stories and, and evidence of philanthropy supporting um, organizations during the civil rights movement in the, in the states, for example. Um, we know that, that, that money and resources are just a required um, a required necessary tool uh, to advance social change in communities. We, we need money to, 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 to actually build power and to fund organizations and organizers who are doing the work. So, uh, you know, I, I think what's happening is really exciting. Um, and, and over the last, you know, five years, maybe 10 years, 
institutional philanthropy has actually in the states um for sure has actually hired lots of folks from social movements to work inside of these institutions and i can unpack that for a little while if you want to but you know and i think um you know we we are folks who come from uh the struggle folks who have experienced firsthand uh you know uh, what it's like to to be um, impacted by the issues that philanthropy seeks to um, to to resolve or to influence, and so um, you know that proximity and that experience is is priceless. It's something that we bring in um, and an intuition around where funding needs to go, and um, you know sort of a, a litmus test to the strategies that organizations are are grant making committees are developing, right? I always remember when I was earlier in my career and I was sitting at around foundation tables and we were brainstorming and thinking of strategies. I always kind of held my mother there with me in spirit. And I would ask myself, like, does this, when my mom participate in this, does this make sense for her? Because I, I came from a family living in poverty. My mother is a domestic worker, was and still is. And I remember being in conversations like we should design these these workshops for poor women and, you know, they can they would come like, you know, three times a week and, you know, and I would just think to myself, my mom has no time for that. Like she would like, why would she, do, you know, and so when you have that lived experience. Um, you know, uh, and, and that uh, that that wisdom from from being so close to the ground and having that proximity and that accountability to communities. It's just a different type of leadership that we can bring to these uh, decision making tables. Yes. And I think, you know, I so appreciate you framing it with bringing your mom to the table, because I actually said in my interview at Hewlett that I asked my grandmother if she thought I should take the job before I did. <laughs> and she told me, go for it. So I took it. Um, but I think there is this question of, you know, how much do we have to be responsible for versus how much are we supposed to be the change? You know, one of the things I used to ask a lot of times um, of good friends and colleagues at Hewlett um, is, you know, I wonder if any of my colleagues ever see themselves ever needing to be the beneficiary of this grant making. Like, do we ever see ourselves as being in a situation where we would need so badly and I don't know how many of us in philanthropy feel that way. I felt that way. I, I have seen myself on both sides of the need, but I think that is another context that sometimes really needs to come to the table. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Thank you for such a thoughtful answer to that question. I really appreciate sort of the focus that you have on moving capital and wealth. I think it is a very unique contribution to the sector. And when the book came out three years ago, I don't know that people were talking about endowments. <laughs> and I know that many participatory grant making institutions really strive to equitably and justly distribute the money that they have and the money that they receive. But a lot of participatory institutions are actually intermediaries. And in some ways they are beholden to the larger funders that are you know, bankrolling their operations. And so how do you think those organizations like mine that exist in the in-between, how do we wrestle with these concepts about endowments and reparations when we are so rarely ourselves endowed? Yeah, um, sort of two streams of thought there. Um, I'll, I'll start kind of with the second part of the question and then I'll get back to um, uh, the first part. You know. I, 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 I run an intermediary, Liberated Capital, and um, in the last year where so uh, many foundations actually stepped up to fund racial justice and we're looking for partners, intermediary partners led by people of color, uh, we benefited from that as did many organi you know, uh, sister organizations um, that we work in solidarity with in, in the US. And um, I think this question came up for a lot of us, like all of a sudden we have more money than we're used to having. Um, what, what do we do with that? Do we, you know, our value has always been to, to get money out the door, get the money out the door, get the money out the door. But yet we were holding this tension of what about next year? What happens if institutional philanthropy moves on and is no longer interested in our communities? Then we have this like rush and this infusion of, of funding and then next year we're struggling again to raise that money. 
And so um, I had a conversation with several folks around um, what does like endowment building or saving some resources for later mean to us? And it actually means something very different. When I advocate for large, uh, you know, institutional foundations to spend down their endowments, it's very different from our organization that is looking to perhaps um, begin to build a small endowment. We're not looking to build an endowment for hundreds of years to come and to, you know, grow wealth and 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 um, have these, you know, um, uh, and, and really replicate bad philanthropic practice. Um, it's, it's really different if we are looking to put away a little bit of money for the next year or two for, um, for our communities to ensure there's something there available. And I, I don't feel guilty about that. And I've, I've said to others that they should feel liberated from, from doing that as well. You know, it kind of goes back to that old adage of like, you know, what being having money and having wealth, right? Right now we have money, but still as intermediaries, we don't have wealth, right? Um, and so I think that we can be mindful about building wealth, but a wealth that is still accountable and transparent um, and um, responsive to the community, not about building our endowments for, our, for the sake of our own legacy or, or building our own power and that type of thing. So it's an interesting um, sort of dilemma that some of us are facing because we've never even had the opportunity to consider, <laughs> you know, that, that question in the past. Um, you know, what I'll say about, um, you know, sort of intermediaries that are, are dependent on uh, philanthropy, this is where, you know, I, I am a major fan of participatory grant making, a major, major fan. But the one thing that uh, sort of sort of bothers me is that a lot is, is the fact is where we sit in this ecosystem, that a lot of large institutional foundations carve off a little piece of money and, and sort of give that to us that, you know, and, and it can be performative, right? And if it, at the end of the day, we still have to uh, account to these institutions, we still, as people of color, color have to account to, um, you know, mo boards that are mostly white men, then where where is the liberation in that? There's nothing super radical or um, liberatory uh, uh, about that actually, right? And so, I still think that we're that it's a step in the right direction, but where we need to go from here is that we still need to put pressure on these organizations to be more democratic, right, and to transfer more of that wealth into uh, around two decision making tables where uh, you know we are making re decisions about those resources um, in partnership with community. So there's a long ways to go. I see that this group of people um, and being organized in this way is really elevating. Um, uh, you know, a path that is the right path for foundations to take, but it, it is really, um, you know, it, it's sort of like even around issues of racial justice, some folks want to make the, the grant one time and say, well, we did that, we're done, and then we're going to move on. Um, the grant that foundations have made for participatory grant making, the grant that they've made for racial justice or whatever, they've already earned that money back, and so it, there's no loss in their end. I want institutional philanthropy to give to participatory grant making, to give to racial justice, to give to uh, gender justice and to all the other groups until it actually hurts, until they actually see a dent in their endowment. That is where we see a shift and a redistribution of wealth and a shift in power. Um, so we're working at it. We're all building towards it, but we have some ways to go to continue to push these institutions to come off of that wealth and let us actually share decision-making power over those resources. Yes. And I think, you know, thinking about that, hold on one second. I'm so sorry, folks. My dog is like eating something that might kill him. Okay. Taken <laughs> care of. Um, so what I was thinking about in that is even in, you know, institutions like the one that I used to work with, which definitely had a really excited and vociferous appetite for participatory methods, there are a lot of questions about how much to who, who are the right representatives of which communities, and I think this, this group has such an opportunity to contribute to and lead that conversation because there are years and years of practice of understanding. Um, and I think what comes with that is an ability to really move the needle. So I just, I'm thinking about ways that even those that are interested or excited at larger organizations to do this work, how do we provide best practice and how do we push the conversation so that the trust can be built in the method so we can start moving large amounts of money. Uh, I'm with you on that. 
Um, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, because I think not talking about the moment that we're in would be a mistake. And one of the things that I love so much about your book is that you wrestle with, you know, strategy at the same time as conversations about grief. And I'm a person that grief, you know, grief has taught me a lot about myself. And I think we've all been in this moment of deep grief that has been ongoing for over a year. Um, do you think that that has had a role? You know, you talk about this idea of softening enough to feel. What role do you think that has had in compelling philanthropy to move towards strategies of justice, if at all? I do think it's had a role, um, you know, to get to a place of true transformative healing, you, you've got to sort of rip the bandaid off and feel the pain. And um, I talk about this a lot in my work around truth and reconciliation is that, you know, we, we, we have so much work to do to actually um, document the, the facts and the stories of folks who have been marginalized. Um, and there's an act of erasure, right? And right now in the States where folks may, may know we're, we're in a, a major battle, right? To uh, around what's taught in schools, right? There's an attack on teaching critical race theory here. Um, in 27 states um, out of the 50 in the US, there's no mention of Native Americans at all in, in K-12 uh, curriculum, right? So there's an act of erasure of history and we're such a, a global society that is very futuristic and looking forward and, and, and just imagining all the time, which is also which is necessary. Um, but I, I think that we're not going to move forward um, in our communities until we actually reckon with the past. And so this past year um, for me in 2020 was a year where I experienced a lot of grief, um, probably like a lot of folks here. Right. So obviously what was happening with the pandemic. Um, and the way that it disproportionately impacted in indigenous communities in the US um, was, was heartbreaking. Um, I had a lot of personal loss in 2020 as well. Um, and, uh, and then of course, the murder of George Floyd, which was a moment around the world that caused us all a stake through the heart and like this, this, this sad, sad uh, realization that after so much work, we have so much more work to do to see to see justice in communities and to you know, and so, the so much racial healing that is needed. And so, what what felt so different for me personally in 2020 um, is that I did feel that that grief was like this kind of got to this like collective level, and there was so much solidarity because literally every person was impacted in a way, right? Like regardless of your demographic, regardless of how much money you may have, like at some point, like you couldn't travel or you couldn't like, it, it was just this, this moment of like, there was so much death. There was so much death. Um, in, in Brooklyn, where I was living at the time, I lived right by a hospital where there were 18 wheeler trucks out there where they literally had to make makeshift morgues to carry out hundreds of bodies a day. And at one point, like, I think like 800 people passed away in one day. So we were just as a society, just seeing so much um, death all around. And then of course, um, you know, again, the racial justice uprisings brought to the light what we many of us have known for a long time that we continue to the, the racial violence and the, the, the lack of accountability for the murders of, of innocent black folks that's happening. So so there was just a heaviness that I think cut to the white meat, as we say, where I'm from, or, or got to a very deep, intimate place um, in our spirits and souls that um, you know, I, I think has been a good thing for us to like feel that we work in the sector of philanthropy, y'all like love of people, love of people. And we, we, we so um, at times have gotten so professional that we forget that we're really just in the people business, right? We're here to love people. We're here to feel things. We're here to connect spiritually and to listen and to build relationships. And I'm all about the art and science of grant making. Like I, I am a philanthropist geek, a philanthro nerd with the best of them. Um, but, you know, really during these times where we were in crisis and people's lives literally were on the line, we had to throw a lot of that shit out the window and just respond to like, you know, in, in a way that a good person would, right? 
And so um, I am so inspired by the way our sector stepped up, both in the institutional space where what we all thought was impossible and we haven't seen foundations ever do, that began to happen. Money was moving quickly. People put aside their theories of changes, their criteria, all of that stuff to just respond in the moment because it was the right thing to do. And then in community, philanthropy of community, the mutual aid, um, that that came up and the way neighbors were just helping neighbors the way this 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 the marches in community were multiracial and there's a deep radical grown-up solidarity that i just have never experienced in my life so for me that that moment was um this this collective moment is 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 just something that i hope that we carry forward with us because it's something that we've lost right because of colonization because of a history of systemic racism and white supremacy we have gotten disconnected from each other we've internalized these ideas of individualism and the hoarding of power and the hoarding of resources but what we ultimately know in 2020 showed us is that none of us can wait on the government and none of us can wait on big philanthropy to save us, y'all. It is up to us, right, to take care of each other. And I hope that that spirit um, carries us forward into this, this movement of participatory grant making, because ultimately, I think that's really what it's all about, right? It's like, let's get around the table. Let's look at these resources. Let's let's collectively decide where we need to, to support and, and, and move this money in the spirit of love to help our, um, our relatives. So, yeah. That grief is, I still feel it, um, but I, I do feel that openness toward healing um, in this moment um, for where we are. Yeah, I think, first of all, thank you for taking that first so personally and really being vulnerable in your response to that, but also taking us through the connection to systems because that was the big piece for me as I think I understood for a brief moment that these systems that we spend all day dreaming up are made up of a bunch of people and we happen to be those people and we are at best arbiters of that system but we are no different than the folks that we're trying to affect and you know I say that because I had the honor of designing a, a participatory inspired uh, collaborative grant making round at Hewlett um, to do 15 million dollars worth of sort of racial equity grants and the whole thing started with a really hard but really beautiful conversation with Larry Kramer, who leads the foundation. And it was a real one. And I think that connection of the person to the system is something that I didn't expect to experience in an institution like that. And so I think we have to hold that as we kind of transition back to normal, although I'm you know, not sure there ever was normal. But I do hold that sort of, how do we keep this raw moment open? Not from a state of continuous grief, but like there was some real connection happening there. Um, okay, so I have one last question and then I wanna open it up to the group. So if you've been holding your question, now's the time to hit the chat. Um, I wanna talk about this theory of change question because <laughs> as much as we wanna throw them to the wind, they still seem to run our lives. And I think you know what I've surmised as the, general theory of change of a lot of participatory funds, um, you sum up really well in your book, which uh, I'll just read the quote, you know, working with people who are different from you in a culture that is not your own, using language that is not the way you naturally express yourself, these challenges push your brain to expand its habitual ways of thinking and sharpen its performance. This, I think, is the crux of many of the theories of change of participatory funds, bring people together who don't usually talk, give them a, collect a connective and collaborative challenge, and in that process, sharpen their performance and expand their thinking, right? At the same time, you have also suggested that participatory grant making folks shouldn't pat themselves on the back just yet, which I agree with. I'm always about striving. And so you talked a little about this before, but you know, what can we do differently in the pursuit of equity? How might we push ourselves a little further past this theory of change and really do more to support both issues of equity and racial justice? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. Like, I, I think that there, there are some fantastic models out there. Um, and, you know, I, I think though, like just, it's it's in the, the, the devil is in the details as they say um, with this work. And I think, um, there are many folks kind of jumping on this moment, um, the hype around participatory grant making and, and starting different committees. 
And um, I think we have to just be really eyes wide open around how we're walking into that and what we're doing. Um, I, I think, you know, I was talking with some folks recently who um, had been approached to serve on some of these committees and what we're seeing happen sometimes in the US context is that, you know, we're going to these social movement leaders and we're like overextending them and inviting them in to, to serve and it's very performative right like we're quick to want to like co brand ourselves as philanthropy with these these leaders and communities that that are. Um, kind of on the front lines of change. And sometimes we, we we might be giving them an extra job to do, right? So these folks already have a job to do. They're leading movements. They're running nonprofits. And now we're asking them to come in and perhaps do our work <laughs> as funders. So so I think it's, a, it's really a nuance of, uh, around how um, we are designing these programs. And sometimes it's about scale. You know, there's one funder that I talked to recently who gives away a really small amount of money and, 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 you know, all dollars matter, you know, um, <laughs> but, you know, they were building a pretty comprehensive, you know, program of and engaging community and making decisions that felt like for me, just more work for around a small amount of money. Right. Um, I have heard from activists when we're talking about, you know, weighing in on some significant dollars, they don't mind doing the work. So it's just kind of being aware of like, why are we inviting community in? Who are we approaching? What extra labor might we be putting on the backs of folks who are already spread thin? And are we ultimately really giving over power? Because at the end of the day, like I said earlier, if folks are weighing in and making decisions around a table in a way that um, appears to be democratic, but then there's some board or some other group of folks who get the final say so, then we're not really sharing power. Like I wanna see that power to be um, power to be completely relinquished and handed over to folks to make those decisions. So I, so that's sort of what, I, what I'm thinking through. And I don't have like the answers to that. I've just seen examples where I'm like, that feels really authentic. Like I feel like they're really sharing power. I feel like, like uh, folks want to be at that table. And then I've worked at places before where we've asked folks to come in to in a way that was performative. And of course, they say yes, because we fund them. Right. So we've got to just be aware that whoever is responsible for paying the light bill in the organization still has the power and that power dynamic can still show up in a way that could be harmful, even in a participatory grant making way. Um, and, you know, and then what I would say is that I think collectively we have to all continue to uh, center racial justice in our work, right? Whether we are a fund that's focused on the queer community, the disability community, uh, women, we still need to have a racial justice analysis that, that's intersectional across all of those um, types of work, because we all know that regardless of the, the population that we're serving, um, that for um, people of color, those issues are exacerbated. And so we should be intentional about centering uh, race in our work and being especially attuned to anti-Blackness that can show up um, in, in that space. So that's, that's work that needs to happen. Um, and um, a lot of the uh, community giving models that, that I've seen happen are, are doing great work, but you know we can all do better around centering that racial justice lens in our work. And then the last thing I would say is like, this is a movement. This is a powerful people. I see 165 people in here. And I know that many more will watch this. This is a movement of folks who have, um, you're here, I'm assuming because you actually want to move power. You want to shift something. You want to center community. And so let's keep coming together and pushing. Let's not let these conversations die as philanthropy, uh, you know, relapses back to a, another way of being. Right? We have to keep moving forward for here. We're not. We're not going to stop talking about racial justice. We're not going to stop talking about centering community. We're not going to stop talking about sharing the power. We're going to continue to unrig this game in philanthropy and shift power and decision making to communities. So. Um, I think just continuing to hold this space and being committed to that, right, um, is something that we all have to do. So that's my commitment. I, I am like, I'm not stepping down from the pulpit. I'm going to keep banging on the table and saying this until, uh, you know, more and more people hear it and we see those resources shifting. Oh, I'm right there with you. I would say the major reason why I was so excited to join the Curve Foundation is we invest 
one in the history of LGBTQ women and non-binary people, but also the future. And I think this reflexive thinking that we have to have all the time of not forgetting our past, but protecting our future by preparing to resource it is something that is unique when you're sitting proximate to movements. You know, I think that the time horizon is different. It's a little less linear than some of the other ways I've thought about philanthropy. Oh, okay, well, we have so many lovely questions in the chat and I'm going to try to get through all of them. If I don't, I'm really sorry. So the first one, I think, and Edgar, I think we'll just try to do these together because some of them are sure. a little participatory specific and I'll kick it to people in this group if I think they have a better answer than me. So Katie Love, wherever you are, be ready. Um, <laughs> okay, so Nilani asks, uh, they say that they're participating in the Chicago Cultural Treasures Participatory Grants Review and serious efforts have been made to influence or control the efforts of the group. Do we have pointers for them or perspectives that we should uphold? So I guess the question is when someone is trying to really control your efforts in a participatory process, what are some pointers? Is that correct, Nalani? You can hit me in the chat if I'm getting that correctly. Okay, I think that's the question. I, I can start if you want and I'll kick it to you, Edgar. Sure. Sure. So I think one of the issues in these situations, and this is something that I've really emphasized with funders, is that funders do not do a good job that wanna invest in participatory grant making of articulating what their boundaries are. They say, oh, well, we're gonna give power to this group and they're gonna tell us what we need to do, but also we can't give more than 10,000 and also you can't give it to C3. And hey, by the way, you can't give it to this community organization and we don't really do advocacy. So no, none of these actually are gonna be able to be funded. And it is in my experience and my research, often the easiest way to kill trust um, in that relationship. And so I think if you are on the other side of that, Nalani, the question that I would be asking is, what are, can you articulate to me clearly what your expectations are from this, what we can and cannot fund, and how we might be able to come to an agreement? Like, do you have a decision-making matrix for how we're gonna do this? Because a lot of times the power dynamic is such that we don't feel empowered if we're participants to ask questions of the institution. But if the point is power sharing, sometimes you have to take it. And so that's my quick advice. I have gotten those questions before. So uh, when sitting in another seat and having to answer them really helped figure out some of the stuff that was a little murky. Do you wanna add anything, Edgar? You know, I mean, this is not a direct answer, but I'm just thinking of um, a quote recently from a program I did with Vanessa Daniel, who runs the Groundswell Fund. And that is that the cornerstone of white supremacy is the need to dominate and control. Mm -hmm. And this is that control factor that is so mm -hmm. pervasive in our sector is just deeply rooted in white supremacy and a mm -hmm. need to dominate and control. And we'll never get to freedom and liberation if we are building from that cornerstone. And so it's really just going to continue to sort of think about how the tenets of white supremacy culture and domination are showing up in our sector and, and pushing, 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 naming it, pushing it and trying to shift that because mm -hmm. that is really the cornerstone that that is uh, rooted um, and coming from that type of behavior. So we've got to mm -hmm. mm -hmm. call it out. And I think that takes me to my next question, which came from Alex, uh, which says, what are some strategies for starting participatory grant making at organizations that have little to no experience and are steeped in oppressive, exclusive, and traditional approaches to grant making? I'm going to give a controversial answer. The answer is don't. Um, and the reason is, uh, as a single person trying to move an organizational culture from not only no participation, but exclusion, all the way to participation, you'll burn out before you get there. Now, in terms of socializing the organization to participatory grant making, there are a lot of opportunities that you have. Uh, I think philanthropy has a couple of almost there approaches, uh, like listening. I think listening, if it's not being used, is a way to start the conversation. And there's a lot of material out there, the Fund for Shared Insight, there's tools. And it's a way to socialize people who are inclined towards metrics and outcomes to listening to the actual people that we're trying to serve. And once that conversation starts, I don't think it's too much of a step to get to, well, why don't we bring those people to the actual table and listen to them IRL? That's my hunch. Edgar, what would you say? I, I totally agree. I love that. I think that any move to, to, to bring in community for the sake of like, I'm going to use this as an organizing strategy to like, 
you know, shift mm -hmm. some things up here. That's unfair to the folks from community that you're bringing in because mm -hmm. that is really our work, um, the folks who, to, who work there. And if we're launching a, a participatory grant making effort, it should really be about empowering, empowering and, and centering and, and giving the power over to that group and, and not mm -hmm. creating extra work that could traumatize uh, you know, um, and harm the folks that we're trying to help. <laughs> and it can do, I think it can do a lot of damage um, yeah. personally. I think you don't, you know, we all know what it's like to be used. You don't usually get a second chance uh, in those situations. So another question for Lily from Lillian is, it would be good to understand if and how ethics can frame and shape the way participatory grant making can strive to be better in relation to democracy and power and if so, are there examples or measurements? You know, I'm going to say, Lillian, I think you should come back to this group, to be honest, because there are a lot of uh, examples. I would point to Mama Cash, which is an incredible participatory grant making organization. Disability Rights Fund has been involved in moving power and democracy for years and years. So I would say there are a lot of funds that actually have been really successful in uh, getting their movements connected to more money and more power. Um, I think those are good examples. I don't know if you have another answer, Edgar. Uh, I mean, what popped in my mind when I was hearing you read that question was just sort of, you know, other types of processes like participatory budgeting processes that exist in some communities across the state, right? Which I think are inspiring for uh, along the same sort of intent as what we're trying to do here, where there is data and there is research but that shows that when we actually um, allow the community to decide how we um, redistribute resources or where money goes in, in a budget in a collective way that that actually increases uh, civic engagement and democracy. So mm, if you're looking yeah. for like data and research, those kinds of things around it, I would look to participatory budgeting that which that's been around and I know there's data around that that, that can speak to how the impacts on democracy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Edgar, I appreciate it. Um, so I have a question from Nazra, who asks for both of us, um, what is shaping our thoughts when it comes to building trust when we can't be proximate to our movement leaders, especially in COVID times? And as a follow-up, what level of patience is required for the donor to not require old trust in philanthropy, but builds on justice and healing trust-based relationships? So I'm going to start this, Nazra, because I actually got a really sick opportunity to do this. Um, so last year, uh, uh, in partnership with my two mentors, Faye Torsky and Amy Arberton, I was able to design a grant making process at the Hewlett Foundation to distribute $15 million to either black led organizations that were working uh, towards racial equity, or organizations working against anti black racism. So we didn't we weren't race specific, but the mission needed to be focused and rooted in black communities. And these were organizations, the organizations that ended up get, getting selected were selected through a participatory process with all of our staff. Um, and these were not organizations we traditionally funded. We are not a social justice funder. This was not, that was just not our normal deal. And so I'm calling up, I'm literally sending cold emails to people like Alicia Garza, like, hey, uh, I have some money. Can we have a call? Um, which is probably one of the most conspicuous things anyone's ever received. Two grantees thought I was a scammer because of my last name. So that's just to tell you. Um, and so I say all that to say I had to build trust <laughs> very quickly um, with folks that are inclined not to trust me. And so what I would actually say is, do have you gone far enough to build trust inside your own organization? And I say that because before any of this grant making took place, I had buy-in from grants management, from the legal team, from program staff, and from the president. And we all sat down and said, what actually has to happen to make these grants? And what would we like to happen? In that conversation, a lot of stuff fell away. What foundations are legally required to collect to make grants, it's not that much. What we have are systems of mistrust that require us to collect all this information in order to make a decision. And so by basically building buy-in with our grants management staff saying, I wanna get your expertise. How can we do this with the lens to racial equity? Talking to the legal staff who we usually only go to at the very end, and then they have to tell you this is all illegal. But building a collaborative and trust-based process inside, I could then go to folks and say, here's money. You don't have to do a report. You don't have to do an application. We're gonna set it up so that you have you know, whatever terms you like. So it's kind of a convoluted way of answering the question, but I think, 
I always emphasize building buy-in internally because you are one person or a small team. And if the organization is not going to hold you up, that's ripe for issues of mistrust. What would you say, Edgar? Um, um, huge, like major data to all of that. And I'll speak a little bit sort of trust towards community. You know, um, for, for me, I mean, it may be a, a special situation, but our, our um, grants over the past year really prioritized native-led organizations responding mm -hmm. to the pandemic. And so what I did was I went to trusted institutions that um, and, and networks of, of native organizations, right? So for example, mm. when the pandemic was hitting in our city centers first, right? Cause it kind of came to Seattle, then it came to New York. Um, I went to the National Urban Indian Family Coalition, which is a coalition of all the urban native nonprofits, right? And I basically, you know, so if you're in that network, then I know you're legit. I don't have to like act, do, do, do any type of due diligence. And I basically said anyone in this network can just send me um, applicate by application. It's like a, a Google form with four questions and we will send you a check. And so um, I, I, I went to where trust already was, right? Mm, I happen to have a good amount of trust that. because I am native and it's, a, you know, we're a relatively small community, but I still work in philanthropy and philanthropy has harmed my community. So I went to those places where, where trust already exists and sort mm. of piggybacked on those efforts. The other um, thing that we did was in the rural communities or tribal communities as the pandemic spread to the Southeast and was really just slamming the Navajo tribe and the Hopi tribe is I actually uh, made a grant to a local organization there to um, basically put together a list of every single native led mm. COVID mutual aid effort that was happening in that region. And we did the same thing. We're like, if you're on the list, you get a grant. Like we, mm. we open up funding to you. And so it, I, I went as local as I could because I didn't have the time as a, a very small staff to do all the due diligence, to call. Mm -hmm. And plus people were busy. People were literally saving lives and trying lives. to get other people. They didn't have time for exploratory call with me about funding or any of those <laughs> kinds of things. So um, those moments of crisis like really pushed us to find where the work was happening and to go there and to find um, an ambassador to help us figure out where to put the resources really quickly. I love that. And I think the anecdote that you just gave is actually a perfect answer to this next question, which I would elaborate on in my answer, which is, is there any evidence that participatory grant making or trust-based philanthropy actually produces better impact? There is this underlying assumption that any committee can pick winners better than chance. I'm not sure this is a question of composition rather than an intrinsic limit of the committee-based and competitive funding model. So what I would suggest, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this, Edgar, but I learned from my research is I think we need to reconsider how we think about impact and where we need to see impact. So in my understanding of traditional outcomes-focused philanthropy, impact only matters if it's an outcome that you can measure, as in a future-looking lens to impact that sometime in the inevitable future, we will see a major change and on the way we'll take you know, little markers that we can measure to say we're on our way. I think in a participatory setting, the question is how much impact can we make from day one? So how can we resource community members by paying them to make decisions? By bringing them together to collaborate, are they gonna then network, possibly work together as institutions? Then we're gonna have them learn all about all of the other folks in their movement who have applied for this, this grant so that they can get a better understanding of the whole ecosystem that they organize around. And then we'll move money into it, but now we've got what? A benchmark or a baseline for a larger movement, new relationships, new networks, and we've moved money. That is impact as an ongoing practice rather than impact with a forward lens. So I would pose the question back, which is where do you wanna see your impact? Do you wanna see it in 10 years or do you wanna see it now? Edgar, what do you think? Yeah, you know, it's it's um, really good question. I mean, when I think about impact of a of participatory grant making, I mean, my first question is around the people that are involved, right? So, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm like anecdotally, I would imagine, and I, I feel like I have heard from folks that being involved in these spaces, like has been helpful, right? We have an indigenous advisory group of, of folks that we convene on about a, a bi-monthly basis who 
uh, do influence our work. It's not a grant making committee per se, but I know for a fact that by creating that space for for, for very busy indigenous activists and organizers who um, um, typically don't get to come together, it, it's been very like mutually reinforcing and relationships have developed out of that and like lots of our other opportunities. So I think that matters, but I have to say it really matters how I built that table, right? I built that right. table to center them and to benefit them, you know, versus like, let me build this table to get what I need to say that I did something <laughs> and the check a box that I, you know, again, like performance over here, yeah. right? Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I'll just say in terms of impact for me is, and this is a question for everything we do in philanthropy, whether it's this type of worker or otherwise, are we ultimately moving more money? Like, does, does all of this work and this effort result in additional funding going to communities of color mm -hmm. um, that haven't received funding before? Because I'm willing to do the extra work if it's going to result in a net increase mm -hmm. of funding that previously was not available. My, my guess will be yes um, to that. I'm, there may be data folks on the call will probably know much better than me, but um, I can say for a fact that I do feel like we're trending up in terms of the amount of philanthropic investment that's going to native communities in the U.S. And a lot of that is the result of um, a very, um, you know, so, sort of open source participatory like process that we have at Liberated Capital. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of powerful folks coming around the table from our community that are also making demands of philanthropy in a different way. So um, that's, that's the question that I think we have to think about because we can be guilty in this sector of doing, having lots of conversations, doing lots of reports, having lots of conferences um, for years and years and years, and then you know not seeing a shift in where money and power is going. So I mm -hmm. think that's the that's the ball to watch or the north star for me. Um, and my my gut is that hopefully that that is something that that is happening. And we're not just creating more work for program officers and for community leaders. Mm. You know, I want to say something. Uh, I think we're going to close here, but I I think what I'll do is just mention something because I think it's important. Many of our structures and understandings of how to make decisions collaborate come from indigenous communities. So I think we need to just keep that in mind. Like this whole premise of bringing a community together, a council, many of these structures are rooted in indigenous communities. So just for those of us that are really enthused about this method, thinking about how you're particularly investing in native and indigenous folks, I think is really important. Uh, okay, Edgar, this has been honestly rad. I wish I could talk to you every day. Um, I think <laughs> what I will do is end with a little bit of a, uh, I don't wanna say a plug, but just a little more information about where you can find me and who I am. And then I'll turn it over to you, Edgar, because we have an exciting announcement. Um, okay, so just a quick uh, plug for who I am and where I am. My name is Jasmine, as I told you, I work at the Curve Foundation. We invest in queer women's media, as well as non-binary people's media. We were founded based on the magazine, Curve Magazine, which is the best-selling lesbian magazine in history, and we just started. So if you have questions about that and the cool stuff we do, you can email me at jasmine at the Curve Foundation. I'll put it in the chat. I also like to talk about other things like social justice, equity, and astrology. Uh, in the meantime, I would also say if you found this interesting, if this was a good use of your time and resources, and you have money, think about investing in this group. I can clearly and confidently say that I would not know half of what I know about participatory grant making if it was not for this group. So if you like what you heard, invest. That's it for me. Hannah, can we get a screen share? Drum roll. Drum roll. <laughs> Very what? exciting. Can you share with us? Has sure. <laughs> Uh, well, you you guys are the, the first uh, to really know. I think we just put this on social media. Um, we're announcing the second edition of my book, Decolonizing Wealth, that will be out on August 17th. And pre-orders are starting today. So um, thank you all for the support. Um, and we hope that you all check it out and reserve your copy. Um, and um, there's a lot of good stuff in there, um, updates and new chapters. And and really um, a lot of content around what has happened since the first book come out, the first book came out in 2018, um, how folks have really stepped up in philanthropy, but also in other sectors uh, to um, center 
um, healing and uh, truth and reconciliation in their work. So really exciting. Um, you can check out all the link is on the graphic, but I typed it there um, to pre-order. And we, for the friends over in the UK, we will absolutely be um, coming over and doing some, some work and events there. So we look forward to partnering with you. Um, yeah, and you can find us at decolonizingwealth.com. All, all of our socials and everything is there. I appreciate you. Thank you, Edgar. Hannah, do you want to close this out? I don't really know how to end that. Um, it's <laughs> It's been amazing. It's been so, so good. Um, some of you know, I, I did a fellowship on part of yoga making and I spent four weeks in the US traveling around meeting uh, people working in this space. And absolutely everybody was like, have you read Decolonizing Wealth? And I was like, no, no, no. So I went to every bookshop. We walked past a bookshop. We went into the bookshop. We were Google independent bookshops. We went into about 30 bookshops across Boston, New York, and Washington. And I was actually having a meeting with somebody in Washington and my partner found the book. And I got this very <laughs> cryptic text saying, meet me on, if I don't know if people watch Scandal, but meet me on Olivia Pope's bench uh, by the White House. <laughs> yes. um, and we did a book exchange where she basically left this book probably couldn't really get away with this but left a book on um in in a paper bag on this bench and like walked off as I walked up to her and it was your book so um your book has followed me through uh, my participatory journey and I would absolutely advocate for anybody reading it I devoured it in about a day um so thank you so much it feels a really nice circle to have you um here with the community um and yeah join us for everything we we love having people involved um in chats around parties you aren't making um check out the website Thank you so much to both of you, Jasmine. Your questions are always so good um, and it's such a skill and we really, really appreciate um, your wisdom, knowledge um, and uh, love and care that you bring to the community. So thank you both so much. Um, have a thank lovely you. rest of the day, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thanks everybody.